afternoon. Uh, my name is Trey Delap, and I'm uh, so delighted to see you all today. Um, I am an alum of the program. In high school, I got to come to nationals, and that was uh, a few states ago, a long time ago. Um, but uh, I really do want to thank you for pushing through and uh, your teachers as well for having this experience because it's so wonderful. I've enjoyed the day so much um, and I hope that you have too. Uh, in my mortal life, um, I'm a lobbyist. I have a small lobbying firm and I also work I'm the executive director of the Nevada Center for Civic Engagement and we are the home for We the People uh, and other civic education programs. So um, I'm excited about that and I'll let uh, my colleagues introduce them. So, so good afternoon, Oregon. And again, thank you for just showing up. It's wonderful that we're able to continue with this in spite of all the challenges that we've faced. So I teach American politics here at the University of Virginia, and I can't wait to hear your testimony. I'm Lindsey Draper. I retired from the juvenile court bench here in Milwaukee County and a former chair of the State Bar's Law Related Education Committee. And one of my favorite activities is getting to spend time with my goddaughter in Tualatin, Oregon. So, uh, you know a little bit about us. Uh, at this time, you can introduce yourselves and definitely introduce your teacher. Hello, we are Unit 2 from Grant High School in Portland, Oregon. I'm Kate Bacon. Hi, my name is Rowan Wilkinson. Hi, I'm Nora Penosha. Great. Um, well, oh, sorry. Was there more? There's, there's two more of us. Oh. Hello, my name is Nicholas Littell. Hi, I'm Sam Allen, and our teacher is Ms. Dee Pasquale. Great. Welcome. Thank you all. So the question um, we have selected, or everyone knows this already, is question one. Um, so I'll read the question and then we'll uh, start. The state sent delegates to the Philadelphia Convention to join with other states, quote, in devising and discussing all such alterations and further provisions as may be necessary to render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies of the union, end quote. To what extent, if any, did the delegates follow their instructions? What experiences of state governments under their new constitution after independence might have influenced the creation of the constitution? Do the decisions of the US Supreme Court function as a continuing constitutional convention? Why or why not? Please begin. When the Confederation Congress called for the Philadelphia Convention, the states passed resolutions selecting, authorizing, and instructing delegates. While the instructions varied, most only gave delegates power to devise and discuss alterations to the Articles of Confederation. Some delegates, like John Lansing and George Reed, attempted to follow the letter of their instructions, but most did not. The instructions were violated four days into the convention when Edmund Randolph introduced the Virginia Plan, which laid out the framework for an entirely new national government. Despite the fact that the delegates did not follow the letter of their instructions, Many argued that they were upholding the spirit. The experiences of state governments under the new constitutions influenced the creation of a system of checks and balances. Almost every state constitution established a three branch system, but power was rarely evenly distributed. In Federalist 48, Madison noted that the legislative department was drawing all power into its impetuous vortex. State executives largely became an instrument of the legislature with Pennsylvania going so far as to abolish the role of governor. In several states, the judiciary was controlled by the legislature, changing judges' salaries at will. This new excessive democracy seemed ideal to many in the states, but was a serious concern for the framers. Another influential experience was the state's refusal to give up any power to the national government. Under the Articles of Confederation, the federal government lacked the authority needed to solve the country's problems, especially the crippling national debt. Many states attempted to address the debt themselves by printing paper money or levying harsh taxes, which ultimately made the issue worse. Change was clearly needed, but amending the articles required the consent of all 13 states. Eight amendments to the articles were proposed, but all of them failed, twice by the rejection of a single state. This inability to amend the Articles of Confederation 
aggravated the crisis to the point that 12 states eventually sent delegates to the Philadelphia Convention. Since the establishment of judicial review in the case Marbury v. Madison, the decisions of the Supreme Court performed some of the functions of a continuing constitutional convention because they continuously change the way in which the Constitution is interpreted. However, there are three important differences between the Supreme Court and a constitutional convention. First, a convention can change the Constitution itself, while the court can only interpret the existing words. Second, a convention's decision must be ratified by the states, while the decisions of the Supreme Court overrule the states. Finally, conventions convene for a specific time and are composed of elected delegates, while Supreme Court justices are appointed for life and meet continuously. Over time, the court has significantly expanded Congress's Commerce Clause power through cases such as Wickard v. Filburn. The court has also identified rights in the Constitution in cases such as Griswold v. Connecticut, which established a right to marital privacy. The Supreme Court's lack of accountability has allowed it to combat the tyranny of the majority in cases such as Brown v. Board of Education, Loving v. Virginia, and Obergefell v. Hodges. However, this same autonomy means that the court cannot be held accountable for decisions that endanger the public good, such as Plessy v. Ferguson, Lochner v. New York, and Bowers v. Hardwick. Leaving the work of constitutional change to nine unelected officials can protect or threaten the principles of our republic. Thank you. We're ready for your questions. Thank you. Very interesting indeed. My question re revolves around the need for an enforcer, and that is Supreme Court makes decisions, they only work if someone enforces them. Legislature makes laws, only works if someone enforces them. That goes straight to the executive power. Um, do you think that uh, the Constitution adequately empowered a executive to enforce uh, the provisions of the Constitution following the convention or ratification? I think the Constitution did do this. I think Alexander Hamilton addressed this in Federal 70, Federalist 70, when he discussed the need for an energetic executive who is able to act and meet the needs of the Union. And the Constitution was a huge step up from the Articles of, Con of Confederation in doing this. And looking back at our history as a country, we've seen several examples where the executive has been able to use this power. Um, primarily during the Great Depression when FDR implemented his New Deal using a kind of a combination of executive power along with cooperation of Congress uh, to implement the New Deal. And then his, the, these New Deal policies were upheld in the Supreme Court through cases such as Helbring v. Davis and NLRB, uh, NLRB v. Jones and Laughlin Steel Corps. Um, I think one of the dangers of the Constitution that the framers did not adequately anticipate was what the dangers that would occur when the president ignored the rulings of the Supreme Court, even though the president is supposed to enforce them. Uh, one instance is uh, Andrew Jackson ignoring the court's ruling in Worcester v. Georgia, uh, in which, where he ignored the court's ruling that the Cherokee Nation's sovereignty needed to be respected, uh, saying, quote, they have made their ruling, let them enforce it. Hey, you had um, some very interesting analysis about how the Supreme Court is or is not like a continuing constitutional convention. And your, your take was that it may protect or threaten rights when it acts in this capacity. But that's just showing what the effects are. When they act in this capacity, is it legitimate or not? Uh, in acting like a continuing constitutional convention, the Supreme Court is practicing judicial review, which is legitimate as it was established in the case of Marbury v. Madison and was also intended by many of the framers, including Alexander Hamilton, who outlined this process in Federalist 78 by saying that the judicial branch has the power to declare laws of Congress void. However, I think if you look at- Clarify though, that I'm not just talking about judicial review, but, but actually changing the meaning of the Constitution, which is not quite the same thing. When the courts act in that capacity, is it a constitutional function or is it not? I think it really depends on the Supreme Court justice and their philosophy. For example, some of the Supreme Court justices go by textualism, while Stephen Breyer 
goes through pragmatism, which requires looking at the issue at hand with the context and analyzing it so that it can affect and get the best result for both parties. And that requires really understanding the constitution with a modern meeting. Uh, I would say also that the Supreme Court fulfills this role as a constitutional interpreter in part because somebody has to. If the constitution does not, is not interpreted, then eventually it becomes obsolete. Uh, many of the framers saw this at the convention, a lot, although a lot of them thought that this, although a few of them thought that this role should not be left to the Supreme Court. James Madison uh, spoke very passionately that about when he said that the court should never have the right to expound the constitution and they should be left only to the constraints of the judiciary nature. I want to go back for just a second to the historical piece that you cited. You made reference to the eight proposed amendments all failing. Why did Rhode Island not attending the convention not serve as a veto? Why didn't that just end it? Um, Rhode Island did not go to the convention because they believed that it would result in destroying the Articles of Confederation. And so and that's what happened, right? Yeah, and so, uh, but they thought by not going that they would um, essentially be vetoing the Constitution or the convention because it would not have all 13 states in attendance. However, that sort of went out the window with the new ratification process aligned in the Constitutional Convention, which required only three quarters of the states to ratify it. But that almost strikes me as saying, never mind the rules, we're going to do something different this time. Uh, that, that is kind of what they did as, I mean, looking at the Articles of Confederation, Article 13 of the Articles of Confederation stated that to ratify an amendment to the Articles, you did need all 13 states. Um, so that just goes to show just how far from an actual amendment the new constitution was, and it was just a completely new document that they implemented. Uh, in addition, it's worth noting that Rhode Island only had, well, Madis Madison called the idea of the Constitutional Convention a return to fundamental principle, that the Constitutional Convention was asking the people what the kind of government they wanted. But the pragmatic reality of the situation is that Rhode Island had 2% of the country's population, very little of the country's general political power, and all of the framers who were at the Constitutional Convention were so fed up with them that they were referring to Rhode Island constantly as Rogue Island. Uh, the, sim the, like, the simple uh, answer of the situation is that the framers just ignored what Rhode Island wanted because they disagreed. Okay. Thanks. Um, I, briefly, how do we, how does the public check the power of the Supreme Court? How do we check that power? Um, well, not, not quite check, can I finish my thought? Mm -hmm. um, while not quite checking the power of the Supreme Court, the public is able to communicate with the Supreme Court through uh, methods like amicus briefs. And as we've seen with very contentious cases like Obergefell v. Hodges, um, the public is involved in these as that set a record number for the filing of amicus briefs as 148 briefs were filed for that specific case. All right, thank you guys. Good job, or the wild Oregon. Oregon or Oregon? <laughs> Oregon. 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 No. <laughs> you guys will have to work that out. Okay. Um, thank you for your responses to this question. And um, what what really stuck with me was this analysis of the role of the court in in its ability to. Um, it's a very interesting concept, and and it requires the consideration of of the process of deliberation that a judicial process is and how different that is from a legislative process or an executive process. Um, and, you know, and the question that I brought up was, was key. What I find so compelling about the Constitutional Convention is the treatment of power. There was no, there was no denial that power didn't exist. It was like, this is power. It comes from the people and this is how we're gonna divide it up as a check and balance. And what I find completely unsatisfying about considering the Supreme Court as a continuing convention is there's no popular check on them. I mean, really the only only thing you can do is amend the Constitution was extraordinarily hard. So um, that's sort of my my thinking at this point with uh, with a lot of what you guys said. And I, and I do appreciate the historical context. 
I like the, the reference to excessive democracy and the experiment was, okay, we give, if we don't have people making the decisions, then they're not gonna get made. So we gotta work out this. Um, the, the, the other piece that, and I think it's elemental to this question is what is an emergency? And this exigency word is a good one. Um, was, if the articles weren't working and the constitution wasn't made, would we have survived, you know, and why? Um, so I think that in thinking about this question, that that needs to be addressed because it's, it's kind of the first thing I went to. What I, but what I, again, with your group, I think we could have a very rich and interesting discussion about all these issues. So the effect of your four minute speech and then your follow up prepared a conversation like that in a, in a way that I know it would be engaging and thoughtful. So I think that you have done the work and you are doing some analysis and, and that was clearly presented today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I do agree with my colleague that um, that it is always a sign of a really strong team that you desperately want to continue the conversation longer. And that was certainly the case today. I have other questions written down here that I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to answer and, and even to continue the conversation that we um, already had. And I also think it's a mark of a good team when you can make a lot of nuanced distinctions as you did both in your opening statement and also in the Q&A. I think that you, you, this was a really strong team in being, a, being able to divide and an analyze questions with the uh, finesse and nuance that you did. Um, you know, one thing that I would have liked to see a little bit more nuance and distinction is in the question of, you know, on the, the subject of, um, the Supreme Court as acting as a constitutional convention, um, I don't think that, that most people would say that by exercising judicial review, they act as a um, constitutional convention. I mean, pretty much, I think the point was made, everyone agreed the, uh, that the courts had this power of judicial review and that was an expectation, but not everybody agreed that the court would have the ability to change the meaning of the constitution. And I think that that was a point that was well brought up when Madison was brought up that, that he expected the court to exercise judicial review, but did not think it was a legitimate exercise of power when I think the word that was used here was expounding, but, um, but certainly um, the latitude of the expounding, which is what Madison complained about with the courts, that that is the controversial part of this question. And I would have wanted to draw that out a little bit more, but don't let that detract from what I already said, which was this was a strong team that worked well together and that did a good job of drawing very clear distinctions in complex questions. So good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I really liked the way, it, it, and I might have said it a little blunter than you did, that, look, you can go ahead and argue about Rhode Island all you want to, but we don't need to stick with a mistake if it got made at some point you move on and they're not going to make a stick there. That you were able to tell me there were 2%, that was funny. I liked that. <laughs> um, what you, one of the pieces that I liked the most in your presentation, you all are on two different levels here on my screen, so that's why I'm jumping around. But one of the, the things that I liked the most when you made a very definite comment about the constitutional um, and the court's review, um, that there were three differences, the court interprets, the, con the convention change. I liked that very much. I thought it was a very strong discussion that said, let me tell you why this is my answer. And sometimes that's missing in presentations. That jumped out at me and I wanted to be sure and highlight that in my comments to you. Wanted to talk to you about the endangering public, uh, the whole thing with, you know, Plessy was not a good one. You know, I, I, I wanted to get back to that. Uh, time didn't allow me. And also time kind of says I need to stop talking. So you all did a good job. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so okay. much for uh, all your work. And thank you to your teacher for adapting um, the pedagogy to this.